Today we're going to build a nuclear powered submarine in the backyard using common household items. No we're not. Just trying to set the bar a little high. I just said, yes, what we're actually going to do today is make a beer using all ingredients that we got from the grocery store. This video is uh, turning out to be a little bit more um, complicated than I thought. So today we are doing a very, um, a very weird and somewhat complicated brew. I actually got the idea from um, the Barley and Hops TV YouTube channel, not to be confused with Barley and Hops Brewing, that's George who does all the distilling, but Barley and Hops TV, he is one of my favorite beer nerds. He did a video about a year ago where he got uh, just all grocery store ingredients and took it all home and made a beer out of it. And I was like, that's cool. I want to do that too. But you know, I can't do anything without fiddling with it. So um, this is me trying to do a grocery store beer with uh, exclusively grocery store ingredients. I highly recommend you check out his video. I'll put a link for him down in the description. So when you're making a beer from grocery store ingredients, you're severely limited on what you have access to couple of things. You don't have hops, you don't have brewing yeast, um, you don't have malt. So all of those things you have to find a, a, a substitute, you have to make it yourself, whatever. So for bittering, I am copying directly from Barley and Hops TV uh, using what he did for bittering. So instead of hops, he did two black tea bags, three bay leaves, and a little bit of coriander. I've never not used hops and I haven't done enough research on uh, hop alternatives. He got a really cool result, kind of a citrusy bright flavor with this combination of bittering, so I'm gonna stick straight to that. But that's pretty much where our recipes diverge. Uh, the other thing, uh, brewing yeast, you know a lot of people when they're trying this, folks end up using uh, bread yeast and I don't want to do that because I've done it for cider a couple of times to try it out and it's gross. It makes your cider end up tasting really yeasty, really, really bready, and it, it's just not good. So what we're doing is we're actually gonna harvest some yeast from commercial beers, some store-bought beers. Basically, and I highly recommend you check out lots of other sources for how to do this, because this is the first time I've done it. But it worked, so I'm very happy. I got three bottles of Sierra Nevada Pale Ale and three bottles of this uh, Deschutes Brewery Black Butte Porter. Not but, Black Butte. It's a geological formation. The reason why I picked those two beers is because they're both unpasteurized, meaning there is live yeast cells within the bottles. Any sort of beer that's pasteurized, that's not the case. There's, if there is any yeast in the bottle, it's all dead because of the pasteurization process. So I looked online and I found the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale is the most common for people to use, but the Black Butte Porter is also an unpasteurized and I wanted to try that one too. Uh, so basically all you do, you take your bottles, you pour out the beer into your stomach, and you leave about a half inch in there, swirl it around, and then pour that into a sanitized vessel. I just use some mason jars. and. Uh, Always make sure you spray a little sanitizer on the bottle, the bottle cap, the bottle opener, in your jars, your jar lids, all that, just to make sure that you're not transferring any bacteria. You want the colony of yeast that you're growing to be exactly what you think it is. Once you get all your yeast collected, you've got to feed it. So what I did is I took my uh, malted corn, pounded this, two quarts of water, ground it up, and mashed it at 150 degrees for an hour and then strained it and cooled it and then added it to my yeast to feed them because that's the thing you can harvest the yeast but there's so little in there you've got to feed it so that it can reproduce and make a larger colony so that you have a healthy pitching rate once the wort was cooled uh, I poured it in there and the wort came out to 1.026 poured that in at about 75 degrees and uh, that was about four days ago and look at that nice healthy yeast colony very very nice and this is the porter yeast and you can see really nice healthy colony in there I mean it started out with like a half a teaspoon so this is really uh, this really worked out well these came out great they didn't get infected and that means that now I have two really healthy colonies of actual brewers yeast to choose from so that I don't have to use crappy old bread yeast because 
grows. So we have the yeast covered, we have the bittering covered. What about the malt and the enzymes? Since you can't buy malted barley and you can't even buy barley that can be malted in the grocery store. The best I was able to find was pearl barley. And this is stuff that you put in soup or you make a salad, uh, like a grain salad with it or you cook it like rice, whatever. But as you can see, it's real pale and it looks kind of funny. If you know what whole barley looks like, this doesn't look like it. It's been stripped of its husk and its germ. So this will never germinate. You can soak it and, and try to germinate it and get it to malt and it never will. You've got to find those enzymes from somewhere. And since I malt my own corn, I figured maybe I could do it that way. But the problem is malted corn, once it's dried, has such a low amount of diastatic power or the, uh, the ability to convert starches into sugars. Basically the enzyme content. Diastatic power is the enzyme content of that malted grain. So for corn, it's like 30. Uh, on the, the scale that they use, it's called Lintner's. Uh, that's the unit of measure for diastatic power. Lintner for corn is like 30. Uh, for malted barley, it's like 150. So there's plenty of room in that uh, enzyme content in malted barley to malt itself, and then any adjunct grains that you put in your grain bill. Malted corn barely has enough to uh, convert the starches within itself that are still within those grains. Um, it just doesn't have enough enzyme production when it's malting. However, I found a way around that. Apparently, if you don't dry the malt, it has way more enzymes in it. It has a way higher enzyme content than after it's dried. So for malted barley, it's normally 150 when it's dried. When it's green, it's like 1500 Lintner. It's crazy. For corn, it's not anywhere near that high, but instead of being 30 Lintner, it's about 100 Lintner. So that means that we have a lot more room to actually convert starches from other grains other than this green malted corn. Um, I actually get this question quite a lot on my malting videos from different uh, viewers. Can I just take the malt once it's sprouted and use that while it's, while it's wet, while it's green? Uh, do I have to dry it and then knock all the roots and shoots off? You don't have to. You can use it. But the reason why the industry, the beer industry and the liquor industry doesn't use green malt, one, it's, it's hard to get the roots and shoots off of wet grain. Like really hard. It presents engineering problems. So for a commercial industry, that's cost. Two, why do you want to get those roots and shoots off? Because they have lots of protein in them. And protein is really crappy for beer. It makes a protein haze and it can also uh, throw some off flavors and stuff like that. So it can complicate the issue a lot. You can do things called a protein rest. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But for a commercial brewery, that extra step means extra money. So they're not going to do that. They're going to shorten the process if they can and it's completely understandable also wet malt has a tendency to spoil on you when you're not ready to use it the last issue is flavor green malt can very often leave a grassy fresh cut lawn kind of taste in your beer and from what i read it can even carry over if if the wort isn't treated properly it can even carry over if you were to turn that wort into a whiskey um, so if you have whiskey that tastes like fresh cut yard I don't know that that would be so good, but um, there's a way around that. And the way around that is just to boil it. Just boil the piss out of the wort for anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes. And since we do that anyway for a beer, we should be fine. About a week ago, I got started malting some corn. It had six days in my malt tumbler robot. If you haven't malted corn, if you haven't seen my robot video, check that out up here. Uh, so that was in the robot for six days. You can tell it looks like it's overdone. And honestly, I never let it go this long. Uh, but these shoots are all pretty uniformly close to an inch long. And the reason why I did that, I found a paper from the 1960s that said that the longer you let it go, up to about day seven, uh, when it starts to fall off, your enzyme production is much higher the longer you let it go. So six days seems kind of like the butter zone. Now that we've got 
that green malted corn, I think we might have enough enzymes to really pull this off. So we've got our enzymes, our yeast, and our bittering all covered. I wanted to have a little bit of flavor, so I took a pound of my dried malted corn and one and a half pounds of this uh, pearl barley and I uh, toasted them in the oven to get some color on them. I actually soaked them for two hours in water and then stuck them in a 150 degree oven for one hour. The, the first hour is just to like try and bring some sweetness into the grain and then two hours at 250 to dry it and then 30 minutes at 300 degrees to bring some color and to actually give it some roastiness. Um, here's the thing about malted corn. If you want to toast it, be real careful because man, does it go fast. It goes from perfect to, wow, that's really dark in like five minutes. Mine is too dark for what I was going for. As you can see, there's uh, barley in here as well as the malted corn. And the malted corn almost looks burned, but it's not. It's just nice and brown. Um, so I wanted more of a caramel malt, but what I ended up getting was something that's very toasty and roasty. It kind of smells like grape nuts. <laughs> we'll see how that turns out. I'm gonna use it. Now I'm just gonna throw all this in the food processor, grind it up, and do my mash. Let's get going. That was a lot of talking. I got my water up to about 126 degrees right now, Fahrenheit. That's uh, just about right for doing a protein rest. We're gonna do a protein rest for at least a half hour, maybe a full hour, just because this has way more protein in it than anything else that you would ever put into a beer. Because of all the roots and all the shoots and everything, I think I might give it a protein rest for a full hour and then make dinner while that's happening. Now we are on to the boil. We're gonna boil this for about an hour. We're going to boil this for 40 minutes, drop in our uh, bay leaves at uh, 20 minutes remaining. At five minutes remaining in the boil, we're gonna drop in half a teaspoon of coriander and our two black tea bags. All right, let's get going. this finish cooling down and uh, we'll see what kind of gravity we get. Remember the grassy flavor, the alfalfa flavor that uh, can accompany that uh, fresh green malt? Well, good news, it's not there. I don't taste it at all. So uh, if you want to use fresh malt, use fresh malt. The wort actually has a really awesome flavor. It's got a little nuttiness to it, a little bit of toastiness to it, but um, a lot of malty uh, flavor to it. So uh, hopefully we'll keep some of that character. Now I just gotta siphon this stuff into the jug and uh, decide which yeast I wanna pitch. Unfortunately, we ended up with less than a gallon and Honestly, that's due to there being an incredible amount of sediment and sludge in this. I just don't want all that going to the bottle. We're gonna lose some volume there. I'm only gonna get like maybe six or seven bottles, but you know, no big deal. That's what experimentation's all about. Oh, <laughs> I have one other weird thing we're gonna do. 
When I first got started home brewing, I did not have any, any fancy equipment. I didn't have any fermenters, so I made one. And I'm gonna do a little throwback for that. I got a one gallon uh, wine jug that I had out in the garage. The lid, I poked a hole in it and uh, threaded some aquarium tubing. So once we get this sanitized and filled up with the beer, we're going to uh, screw that on there and then fill this jar up with water and drop the hose down in there to act as an airlock. If you've got airlocks, please use them. But I thought this would be fun, a fun little throwback to do again. Uh, you know, for the guys that have um, plenty of equipment, great. But what I've noticed is a lot of folks that have been watching my videos have never done this before. And the thing about home brewing is it's got such a steep learning curve that if I can make it seem a little bit more accessible to you without having to spend a whole lot of money on it, as, as well as doing all the research, then good. You know, I agree with the philosophy of having a home brewer on every block. That's, I think that's a great idea. If we can encourage more of you guys to start home brewing instead of getting scared off by all the massive amounts of equipment that guys can acquire, um, you know, great. Wake up, sleepy head. Now we've got our wart with the yeast pitched in. We shook it and aerated it. Got the uh, makeshift airlock on there. All right, so I will catch up with you when it's time to bottle it and taste it. Beer bottling day. This is some cloudy, cloudy, gross looking stuff. It's just, it's about as clear as mud. You know, <laughs> they can't all be pretty. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and take a uh, gravity reading of this just to see where it dropped down to, and that way we know what our alcohol content's gonna be. Here's the other thing. We need to taste this and see how it actually came out. I mean, it smells beery. It smells like a beer, but it's got a much different character than what you would expect from hops. Honestly, this is kind of cool. I can't wait for it to carbonate because I think this is gonna be <laughs> this is gonna be a pretty tasty beer for all the challenges. I actually have a, I've got a little bit of goosebumps going on, a little semi goosebumps because I'm really pleasantly surprised with how good that tastes. Um, it's definitely different, but dang, okay. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and bottle this one and see what happens now um, when you bottle beer if you don't already know if you're not a home brewer then let me go ahead and give you a quick explanation of this when the beer ferments in your jug um, all of the co2 that's in solution off gases through your airlock it comes out so you have to add some sugar to the bottles to uh, get them to carbonate. Otherwise, you're just gonna have flat, gross beer. Nobody wants that. So, uh, you need to add a little bit of sugar. Normally, when you're home brewing, you use corn sugar because it's the easiest for the yeast to process and it has basically no flavor uh, that would interfere with your brew. Since this is a grocery store beer and corn sugar is in short supply in most grocery stores, you can find stuff like caro syrup, which is just corn sugar but it also has salt in it and even the clear uh, caro syrup usually has vanilla in it and we don't want any of those flavors we just want to do the straight thing so um, I looked up on a brewing calculator how much sugar I needed to add to this much beer to get the level of carbonation I wanted and it came up with one ounce I'm estimating that I have three quarts of beer it might be a little less than that, but we're gonna go with three quarts of beer. If it's a little over carbonated, I don't care. We're gonna use just some plain old table sugar, just some white sugar. We're gonna weigh that out, add it to some water, and then we're gonna heat it up and dissolve it in the microwave so that it mixes really well with our beer. I'm just gonna get everything sanitized and start siphoning the beer into my bottling bucket where I'm gonna add the sugar and then go from there into my sanitized bottles and then cap them up. I 
I'm sure you noticed I left a whole lot of beer in that jug because I started sucking up the yeast and I just didn't want to drag all that stuff in there and it was probably some of the other sludge and stuff. This beer is already cloudy enough. I don't want all that crap floating around in the bottles too. Especially when you're a new home brewer, don't be greedy. Leave that crap down in the bottom of the bottle. It's just going to give you a darker, fuzzier, cloudier brew. So just leave it alone. Sacrifice that little bit. You'll be happy you did in the long run. All right, so grocery store beer. For having to leave so much in the uh, fermenter, because of all the sludge. I've only got six bottles of beer. But I think that's okay for an experiment. There they are in all their glory. <laughs> so far, I am incredibly pleased with how this, uh, how this tastes. I'm not super happy with how it looks because, you know, honestly, it's cloudy as all get out and I know I could have done better. But, uh, you know, for this experiment, I think it's pretty cool. My dog is incredibly thirsty. Drinking water, without the care in the world. Jesus. Save some for the guppies. With all that said, we did a ton in this recipe and I am incredibly happy with how it turned out. I'm, I'm honestly quite surprised. So, <laughs> I'm gonna do the tasting in a different video because this has already got to be over 20 minutes or something. I just did so much for this video. But um, as far as being uncon unconditioned and, and uncarbonated, it's still really tasty. So I think it's safe to say it's gonna be pretty good. But I'll post the uh, tasting review pretty soon. Um, so if you enjoyed this video, if you learned anything, if it inspired you to try something, Go ahead and hit the like button because it really helps out the channel. If you want to see what I'm going to do next, if you want to get notified when I post the uh, tasting review for this beer, hit the uh, subscribe button and the little bell icon right next to it so you can get notified when I post new content. Really? Really, ding dong? If you have any questions or comments, post them down in the comment section down below. If you have any suggestions about how, uh, how to get the beer less cloudy, Post them down in the comments, but keep in mind this is a grocery store recipe, so grocery store solutions only. If you need to pick up any of the equipment that I use, the auto siphon, the hydrometer, bottle capper, stuff like that, look in the video description right down below. I'll have the recipe for this and the links for the equipment that I used. And those are all Amazon affiliate links. Uh, if you click on them, I might get like a penny or a nickel or whatever, uh, but it doesn't cost you anything extra. It's basically advertising space. That's it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I'll talk at you later. Wow! What the hell is going on over there? <laughs> oh my god. You're instigating her. <laughs>